thank you to the conference organizers for the invitation to talk to you about the clinical management of COVID-19, focusing upon the experience from Australia. My name is Professor Greg Fox, and I'm a respiratory physician practicing at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney, Australia. And I'm pleased to share with you today some of our experiences in managing COVID-19, both from the perspective of the community as well as from healthcare facilities. I'll be sharing with you some of the strategies that we've used to treat patients, talk about the public health response, and also some clinical algorithms that we use in our hospital, including both pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatments. And I'll conclude with a case to go and illustrate some of the challenges that we face. The COVID-19 pandemic in Australia has had a profound effect on many aspects of the healthcare system. As you can see here, these data from the Australian federal government show that during the early and mid parts of 2020, there were substantial outbreaks in Australia's largest cities, which were rapidly contained as a result of stringent lockdowns and social distancing measures. For most of the subsequent uh, eight or nine months, there was almost no community transmission. But with the arrival of the Delta variant in mid-2021, there was a rapid rise in case numbers, predominantly in Australia's two largest cities, Sydney and Melbourne. And fortunately, uh, as a result of increased rates of vaccination and um, a result uh, of public health measures, the numbers of cases in this latest outbreak have now become, begun to decrease and there's been much lower rates of mortality as the vaccine rate has increased. We can see in Australia that although predominantly younger people have been affected by COVID-19, that the mortality has been primarily concentrated in people who are over the age of 60. And this mirrors the experience in many other countries in the world. Australia's experience is that um, the spread of COVID-19 has been very heterogeneous. So in the largest, most popular states, Victoria and New South Wales, there have been large case numbers. And in other states where there's been very little spread, uh, there's been almost um, no community transmission. And so as I record this at the start of November 2021, some states uh, have been able to eliminate COVID-19. However, um, as uh, borders open and as vaccination rates have increased, um, all of these states are going to eventually face the challenge of managing COVID-19. So first of all, I'd like to talk about what has changed in the management of COVID-19 since the start of the pandemic. You may recall going back to the start of 2020 that the world encountered a new virus for which there were no known treatments. And since that time, uh, there's been a staggering amount of research that's been conducted. And therefore we have a much better evidence-based practice now around how to treat COVID-19 than we did 18 months ago. Secondly, uh, in many countries in the world, vaccination rates have been very high. And this is particularly the case in Australia. Um, in New South Wales, my state, um, first dose rates are now approximately 94%. Um, which means that there's a very different um, epidemiology of COVID-19 compared to what there was in the previous outbreaks. Thirdly, as a result of um, a scale up of uh, resources, um, shortages of personal protective equipment are much less common now. And also we have much faster methods for detecting the presence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so in our hospital system, we use a combination of LIAT gene expert and panther tests, depending upon the urgency of the decision to, um, to test. And in fact, we have now instituted uh, frequent screening healthcare workers who are in regular contact with patients who have COVID-19. But really the biggest change in 2021 has been the arrival of the Delta variant, which completely changed our understanding of um, how to manage patients because of the increased infectiousness in the healthcare setting and also because of the greater case numbers that resulted from more community transmission. So in the local health district in Sydney, where I work, 
we could break the management of COVID-19 down into two parts. We could talk about management in the community and management in the healthcare setting. Now, because there's a large number of patients who have developed COVID-19 who are minimally symptomatic, who don't have very severe disease, we've really tried to keep these people out of hospital and away from transmitting to other people. And so as a result, the vast majority of patients who develop COVID-19 are managed in their homes. Um, they'll be supported uh, by remote monitoring from hospitals. And uh, if they become unwell, then they would be assessed in the emergency department. And the reason that we've taken that approach is to minimize crowding in hospitals and also to minimize the unnecessary transmission of the virus for people who may otherwise have minimal symptoms. And um, it's also important to recognize that um, hospitalization can be a deterrent for people coming forward for testing for COVID-19. Now, in our local health district, we've um, have it had an innovative community-based program called RPA Virtual. RPA Virtual is a virtual hospital uh, which manages patients using tablet computers and remote oxygen saturation monitors. And so for patients who are at high risk, uh, they will have a nurse deliver them an oxygen sats monitor at home, and that will be um, reported at least three times a day uh, back to the hospital um, with 24-hour uh, uh, nursing and medical service, as well as additional supports for people with psychological um, concerns. Now, this model of care has uh, seen treatment of thousands of patients um, in our community and has resulted in a substantial reduction in the burden to, to hospitals. And there are variants of this which have been implemented in other parts of Sydney and other parts of Australia. One of the key to managing um, COVID-19 in the community is effective communication to patients. And so as a result, every patient who has a diagnosis of COVID-19 receives a detailed letter which tells them about the disease, that tells them about what to do if they become unwell, including phone numbers to call. And so this really helps to reassure people that enables them to stay at home. In addition, we give people practical tips about how they can be assessing their own needs. Um, and if they have difficulty getting food or um, being able to do daily activities, they can have call a hotline to get advice from the RPA virtual staff. And if people are feeling unwell, then they call an ambulance and get taken to hospital. Now, the community setting has uh, treated most patients, but the patients who become more unwell, then they need to be treated in a tertiary healthcare facility. And so I'm gonna to talk to you now about some of the approaches that we've taken um, in Sydney Local Health District to managing uh, the complex changes with COVID-19. The first point to make is that the response to COVID-19 has been a coordinated and multidisciplinary approach. It's really brought together all of the different parts of the hospital, including the hospital executive, the different departments involved in caring, including the emergency department, intensive care, respiratory medicine, infectious disease and infection control, and brought in other doctors from other departments. Um, the core management decisions have been made at a daily operational meeting where patients who are being considered for discharge are discussed by a multidisciplinary group. And this is through the daily multidisciplinary disciplinary team meeting. Um, there have been detailed processes and policies have developed. Um, wards have been repurposed, including engineering changes to improve, improve airflow and there's been capital works to go and create negative pressure rooms. Um, there's also been technology updates to allow for data to be recorded uh, to the electronic medical record and staff have been redeployed. There's been education for staff across the health system, including in uh, supply of oxygen and other more advanced life support techniques. And there's been a, a new language or lexicon that have been developed so that people can understand uh, where, uh, how to manage patients in different parts of the hospital. Um, in addition, there's been a coordinated response to critical events such that there are fixed um, processes if a patient requires um, assessment for uh, more intensive treatment. And outside of the core medical support services, we've also been working very closely um, with other medical specialties, with radiology and also with the public health service the people once they're discharged from hospital. And so you can see here that there's really a, an entire hospital response to COVID-19. And we've also had to um, include some of the non-clinical roles as well in this 
such as security for patients who may be agitated uh, or, uh, or where, where there are behavioural disturbances. And we've also been working with the maternity and obstetric service um, to go and uh, provide safe care for women. Um, so this is a hospital which is a general hospital that has both um, adult as well as paediatric medicine. This is an image of the one of the COVID wards at RPA Hospital in Sydney. And you can see here some features of the re-engineering. So there are negative pressure rooms which have been set up. Um, there's uh, purpose-built um, facilities for disposing of um, personal protective equipment for donning and doffing, and staff are trained in how to go and do this and, and are observed when they're donning and doffing their um, personal protective equipment to minimise transmission. Um, you can also see here a display with patient details. And uh, typically during a daily ward round, um, the, the doctors would walk around with a telephone and call and speak to the patients through the glass rather than having to directly have uh, contact and therefore risk um, nosocomial infection. This is a figure just to show the way that the hospital has been reorganised. So the hospital has um, a number of red wards, which are wards where there are patients with known COVID. Um, there are um, uh, pathway wards or, or orange wards, which um, have uh, people who uh, have possible COVID, uh, such as people who have been exposed to patients uh, or people in the community with COVID, but who do not yet have a positive test. And then there are green wards where people have been cleared of having COVID. And we really have separated different parts of the hospital in order to ensure that, uh, that we minimise hospital transmission and minimise the risk to staff. And of course, all staff um, have been vaccinated as soon as that became available. In addition, um, we developed specific guidance around how to deal with different acute situations. So if patients uh, became unwell uh, from the point of view of their breathing, then basic life support guidance was given, particularly to go and avoid people uh, performing procedures that may risk transmission to the person who's, um, who's attending the patient. We also have procedures around behavioural disturbances, both for confused patients and also for patients that may uh, be unwilling to stay uh, in isolation under the public health order. And that's to protect both staff and other members of the public. So the coordination of the hospital approach has been uh, through regular Zoom meetings, through um, the use of online um, sharing of resources, such as guidelines, um, through um, support for junior staff by education and online videos, as well as um, uh, widespread diagnostic testing, um, uh, including uh, routine testing for staff uh, every three days who are on a COVID ward um, and uh, in the period after they're discharged uh, that they leave the COVID ward, uh, as well as um, uh, infection control practices and, and guidelines. I'm now going to speak a little bit about the specific clinical management approaches to COVID-19 that we've been adopting. One of the most important parts of treatment is oxygen therapy. And it's important to make a decision about who should receive oxygen and to look at the trajectory of the patients to make sure that uh, people who are becoming hypoxemic despite oxygen are flagged for more intensive assessment. And so as you can see here, there's a range of different oxygen uh, treatment options, beginning with just um, low flow nasal cannulate oxygen, um, uh, stepping up to high flow nasal prong oxygen, which can be delivered uh, through particular specifically devi designed devices that deliver high flows of oxygen and also positive um, expiratory pressure. Um, CPAP, um, or continuous positive airway pressure for patients uh, who may be becoming more unwell, and also the use of conscious proning, as I'll discuss in a minute. And um, in particular, in relation to conscious proning, um, there is now uh, good evidence from a, um, an open-labeled meta trial to show that uh, the use of awake prone positioning compared to standard of care um, re reduced intubation by about 25% and reduced mortality by about 13%. So simply positioning the patients can have a significant uh, impact. Um, and finally, we have a respiratory support service um, which provides assistance for people, particularly for, for nurses who may not be familiar with delivery of, of these oxygen therapies. Coming back to the, um, the point about proning. So this is a, a, a technique which has no cost associated with it and that can potentially save lives. So by positioning patients lying 
prone or face down while they're awake. Um, this can help to improve the expansion of their lung units and um, ventilation perfusion matching. So in patients who are hypoxemic, um, uh, this uh, is preferred. And you can see here some guidelines for conscious self-proning. So this is particularly for patients who require supplemental oxygen um, and who are not um, uh, responding to uh, the initial treatment. Um, you need to communicate with the patient and ensure that they can cooperate because some patients uh, may not be able to do this and then rotate into a prone position and then um, ensure that they can adjust their position independently. It's important to be sure that there are no contraindications such as airway patency issues, respiratory distress, um, including a rapid respiratory rate or accessory muscle use or a high carbon dioxide. Um, the need for uh, another contraindication is the need for escalation to intubation, agitation, uh, hemodynamic instability, um, spinal or thoracic injuries, uh, as well as neurological issues, morbid obesity, and pregnancy in the second or third trimester, or concerned around pressure areas. So once these have been excluded, self-proning is a very um, simple technique which can make a difference. This uh, figure here just shows uh, one of our algorithms for the use of oxygen and for stepping people up to high levels of oxygen. So in our practice, patients who are on six litres by Hudson mask and have um, hypoxemia of less than 92% um, are considered for high flow nasal prong oxygen or CPAP. And it's of course important to ensure uh, that these resources are used uh, appropriately so that oxygen is not wasted because it's a, a pressure for precious resource. So we need to make sure um, that patients uh, are in fact receiving um, um, an appropriate amount of oxygen supply. The settings that we use uh, in CPAP are 10 centimeters of water as an initial setting for people who um, uh, are requiring a higher flow of oxygen um, and it can deliver up to a 60% FiO2 on, uh, on the wards under our, our conditions. And then there are criteria for escalating to intensive care um, review if the hypoxemia becomes worse despite this treatment. And palliative care is also an important part of treatment. Um, at the point that the patients are admitted to hospital or to the ward, a decision needs to be made around the um, threshold uh, of care, uh, which is acceptable. And so if, if a limit of care is put in place, for example, ward-based care, this needs to be documented to ensure that patients don't receive futile treatment, which may um, cause some discomfort. Um, and that's particularly for patients who may um, have more severe comorbidities or have, have poor prognostic features, which means that they're unlikely to um, be able to uh, leave the intensive care unit if they were to be intubated. Now, I'm going to talk briefly about um, COVID-19 therapeutics. Um, this has been reviewed extensively, and I'd encourage people to look at the Australian uh, government website for um, a very helpful summary of the evidence around these treatments. Um, basically, they can be grouped into prevention, treatment of COVID-19, and then additional therapies for complications. So um, for prevention, citrovimab uh, can be used, although this is uh, not usually available by the time a person comes to hospital. Um, treatment options, including dexamethasone, remdesivir, tocilizumab, and baricidinib, um, all of which are used uh, in our hospital, and then sometimes antibiotics. As I'll explain, there's a very limited role for antibiotics just for those who develop complications later in disease. Now, the phases of COVID-19 um, uh, begin with a rapid viral response, um, and then uh, the host inflammatory response increases. And so the therapies are designed um, in order to go and try and um, mirror that uh, those stages. So antibody therapy, such as citrovimab, can be given early in disease as a way of trying to go and reduce um, the number of uh, the viral replications uh, in, in the uh, patient. Um, antivirals can be used during this phase, such as remdesivir, although the evidence for that is fairly limited. Um, and then immunomodulatory therapy to reduce this um, host inflammatory response phase, which causes much of the, the damage and the morbidity associated with COVID-19 and, and dexamethasone being the one which is, which is cheap uh, and very effective. Now, the evidence for dexamethasone comes uh, from a number of studies, particularly the recovery trial. And this trial showed a reduction in mortality in patients requiring respiratory support 
there was no clear benefit of dexamethasone in patients not requiring supplemental oxygen. And so for that reason, in our hospital, we reserve dexamethasone six milligrams daily for patients who have an oxygen requirement. That is that they are hypoxemic on room air and require oxygen. Um, it's therefore recommended for inpatients requiring supplemental oxygen and not given to outpatients. Um, of course, there are side effects relating to um, steroid use, including high sugars and sometimes neuropsychiatric effects. So Trovimab that I've mentioned um, can be given if is less than five days since symptom onset. Um, and if a patient is not fully vaccinated and has at least one of these comorbidities. Now, these patients um, are a fairly small proportion of the total number of patients who develop COVID-19, but this drug may have benefit. And we particularly focus on people such as those with um, chronic kidney disease or um, severe COPD who we think are going to do poorly. Um, Baricitinib um, is a JAK kinase inhibitor, uh, which is commonly given for patients who have um, who are hospitalized with COVID-19 um, and uh, who have more severe disease. Um, and usually we look for evidence of inflammation when deciding to give this, particularly um, radiologically and also based on inflammatory markers such as C-reactive protein being elevated. Um, this evidence is based upon an international RCT, which found a significant reduction in mortality with a hazard ratio of 0.57 um, uh, at 28 days but there was no significant difference in serious adverse events, including infection, which is reassuring. So this treatment has become a standard uh, part of our um, treatment for inpatients, um, in particular those who require oxygen and have evidence of inflammation, as I've mentioned. So we would not give these to patients who have early and very mild disease. We typically give this as four milligram tablets for 14 days, and the dose can be adjusted for renal impairment. You can see the adverse events listed there. I want to make a brief comment about antibiotics in COVID-19. Um, antibiotics are not appropriate as a first-line therapy for COVID-19 and, in fact, can cause complications for patients. Unfortunately, it's difficult because um, many of the symptoms and signs and radiological criteria of COVID-19 overlap with bacterial infections, and we know that bacterial infections can complicate COVID-19 in, later in the course. Um, and It's been shown that in fact, antibiotic prescribing was very common um, amongst this uh, large meta-analysis. Uh, but the bacterial co-infection was actually very uncommon and mostly it occurred more than 48 hours after admission. Um, and antibiotic prescribing this meta-analysis was associated with increasing patient age and COVID-19 severity. Antibiotics cause um, complications, including Clostridium difficile infection, antimicrobial resistance, and also liver and kidney injury. And so therefore, um, this is the approach which I would recommend, that antibiotics are rarely required on initial presentation with COVID-19, and so therefore they shouldn't be the first treatment given. A minority of patients will develop a bacterial co-infection, and atypical pneumonia treatment is not required, and not all bacteria isolated from the respiratory tract specimens require treatment. And, um, also, we should be evaluating for secondary bacterial infection and considering antibiotics in patients who become febrile after being afebrile um, or having a persistent prolonged fever, people who have new respiratory symptoms such as purulent sputum, where they didn't at the start, or people who have new pulmonary consolidation on imaging, um, although, of course, COVID-19 pneumonitis can, can, can cause this as well. I'm just going to conclude with a brief case study to illustrate some of these issues. So this is a 62-year-old male who had COVID-19. He was a non-smoker, unvaccinated, and he was obese with a body mass index of 30. He presented to hospital on day seven after symptom onset and day five after swab positivity with hypoxemia at home. He looked well and had an oxygen requirement and a normal cardiorespiratory examination. The chest x-ray showed some mild interstitial changes um, and his uh, lymphocytes were 0.5. Um, he had uh, a D-dimer which is mildly elevated and a significantly elevated C-reactive protein and no um, troponin abnormality. So at this stage, the questions to consider were, how stable was he? So to begin with um, the basic airway, breathing and circulation, ABC, to make sure that, that he was stable. Secondly, to consider supplemental oxygen 
and what other respiratory support was required. Thirdly, at the point of admission to consider the ceiling of care, was this patient suitable for more aggressive therapy or should a palliative approach be taken if he became unwell? And in this case, because he was a young, relatively healthy um, male, um, the, the decision was made to proceed uh, with all active measures. The question after that was the location of care. Should he be managed in a ward or an intensive care um, unit? And in this case, the ward was appropriate because of the low level of oxygen. What COVID specific therapies should be given? Um, so what uh, drugs that I mentioned before? Um, and what are the prognostic factors to guide um, uh, decision-making about his ceiling of care and, and what is likely uh, to happen based upon his comorbidities. So in his case, he was admitted, um, he had some poor prognostic markers such as his smoking history and his slightly older age of 62. Um, he was admitted to a COVID specific or red ward and he was continued on nasal prong oxygen. He was given dexamethasone and a proton pump inhibitor to reduce the complication uh, of gastroesophageal reflux and gastritis. And uh, he was given anoxaparin, which is uh, to prevent blood clots, uh, which is a standard dose that we give to patients who are inpatients with COVID-19 and used for full active measures. This is an image which shows the um, electronic medical record. Uh, and you can see here the oxygen saturations going from right to left as time passes. And you can see here that um, at about 4.45 p.m. on this date, uh, the patient became hypoxemic and so therefore was needed to, to be uh, increased uh, his oxygen flow to six litres per minute by Hudson Mask. He managed to remain stable over this time, but had an intensive care review. And you can see that some of the interstitial changes are now increasing, particularly on the right here on this chest X-ray. So the question is, what else can be done? And as I've described before, in addition to um, the tablet therapy, so baricitinib, uh, which uh, is appropriate in this patient given he's hypoxemic uh, and he's got high inflammatory markers. Proning uh, was also a, a, an intervention which we could do, um, which in English we call tubby, tummy time. And so um, this therapy uh, was initiated and it managed to keep him um, relatively stable um, overnight. However, um, uh, the next morning he became uh, more hypoxemic and had a higher oxygen requirement with an FiO2 of 66%. And so therefore he needed to be um, sent to the intensive care unit and progress to intermittent mechanical ventilation. So this is an example of a typical patient uh, who gets worse. Of course, uh, as, as would be the case in any country in the world, most patients who develop hypoxemia um, do not require intubation. Um, and so, um, so if he had continued to be stable, um, then he would have, uh, once his oxygen requirement decreased, be, be transferred back to the community. So this is an example of typical management of a patient who has progressive COVID-19. And, um, and uh, as with many of our patients, this patient had a prolonged ICU admission and a difficult um, uh, post-intubation uh, course. Which just leads me to the final point today, which is around um, post-COVID care. So um, we've been beginning to recognise the significant complications of COVID-19 for a minority of patients. Some patients have a great difficulty even being discharged from the hospital because of an ongoing oxygen requirement. And some patients have ongoing respiratory needs such as tracheostomies or the need for chest drains due to pneumothoraces. And so these patients are, are very difficult to manage um, and very difficult to discharge. Um, there's also complications of intensive care and of prolonged therapy, including gastrointestinal bleeding, stroke, um, uh, and uh, uh, secondary infections as well, um, and uh, other respiratory um, complications. Um, neuromuscular deficits uh, are common in patients who've had prolonged um, intubation, um, and particularly for patients who've been on ECMO, um, uh, there can be difficulties, uh, and mental health issues, including memory loss and, and ongoing um, uh, anxiety uh, and, and depression are also commonly seen in patients who've had prolonged hospitalizations. And of course, isolation from families during this period is difficult. Now, in our hospital, we've begun um, planning for a post-COVID uh, respiratory clinic uh, to manage patients who have long-term disability associated with their lung disease. And in fact, um, it really requires a multidisciplinary approach because 
the long-term complications of COVID-19 are not, not just respiratory, but they're also often cardiac, uh, neurological, uh, psychiatric, um, and also musculoskeletal. So it's, uh, it's, it's very important um, to have a multidisciplinary approach to patients. And so we're following up our patients in an outpatient setting um, and planning to, um, to provide intensive physiotherapy, particularly for those who um, have difficulty with, um, with adjusting to, to returning home. So I'll conclude there and just make a few concluding remarks. First of all, that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has had an immense effect on the rest of the hospital system as well. And so uh, it's been uh, a great challenge for clinicians to be able to continue managing the non-COVID patients as well as those who have developed COVID. Secondly, um, uh, the use of vaccines has seen a dramatic decline in um, COVID numbers and COVID hospitalizations. Uh, and so I think that's going to be an essential part of the ongoing management of COVID-19 going forward to try and prevent people from coming to hospital in the first place. And finally, to say that I think uh, we need to continue to do research to, to look at evidence-based approaches to treating patients with COVID-19. One of the things that has characterised the pandemic has been the use of many non-evidence-based therapies, which can often cause more harm than good. And so I'd really encourage people to look at the evidence-based treatments that I've mentioned um, and, uh, and to particularly avoid unnecessary use of, um, of antibiotics and, um, and other therapies which may complicate um, patients' uh, course. So I'd like to thank um, Dr. Lauren Troy, Dr. Tina uh, Marinelli and Dr. Simone Bisser uh, for slides that they contributed to today's presentation. And again, I'd like to thank the organisers of the conference and wish uh, Vietnam all the best uh, as it uh, meets the challenge of COVID-19 uh, and we are very much thinking about you in Australia and, and um, I think we, we share many of the same challenges. Thank you very much.